today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by Masterworks. Michael, a couple weeks ago, we talked to Masterwork, Masterworks founder and CEO Scott Lynn. And on the podcast, you bought a Picasso. Shares right on the podcast, Picasso. as we were interviewing Scott. And uh, maybe I, FOMO, peer pressure worked. You said, Ben, you have to buy in on this, too. No, I didn't. And I, I think you asked. You said, Ben, no, I think on the podcast, you said, Ben, you should buy in on this, too. I think you wanted... Uh, maybe I did. <laughs> You wanted to get the herd mentality going, so uh, credit to you. I bought in on this. That that was it's, the homie, the homie asses. Yes, it's one of his musketeer paintings. Apparently, they appeared in the 1960s. They have a whole write up on this, and 15.5 million dollars for this was the offering for Picasso it's painting. Ni- it's a it's a nice JPEG. Seems like a steal. So I am. I, I'm gonna. What year is it? It's 2022. I've got I've got six paintings in my portfolio. I'm trying to get up to 10. I don't know if it's going to happen this year alone, but we'll see. W- where are you at, Ben? With the Picasso purchase, I now have eight eight paintings. Eight. All right, listen, here's the deal. Uh, Masterworks just had a Banksy painting go to auction or not go to auction, available for investors. $7.4 million. It sold out in less than three hours. I missed that one. Um, if you want to learn about Masterworks, invest in art, go to masterworks.io slash animal. That's masterworks.io slash animal. And of course, please see important disclosures at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. Michael was out with a post this weekend, 10 predictions for 2022. Uh, I have to take you to the cleaners right away. You should have called this <laughs> surprises. Have you learned nothing? You don't call it predictions. You call it surprises. That way, if it comes true, you say it really was a prediction. And if it doesn't come true, you say, well, I didn't really mean it. It was in just my, a surprise. In my defense, it's the first time I've ever done anything like this. So you're right. Next year, it'll be 2023 surprises. 23 surprises for 2023. Okay. Some pretty good hot takes in here. You said that like large value is going to outperform large growth by 20%. That that would be a crazy kind of year, and that to me would would show that the S and P is probably down for the year because so much of large growth is in those big names. And you actually said, but I but, thi- but but maybe maybe not. What if like industrials, financials, materials lead, and tech just sort of flatlines? That's right. Financials is still a bigger piece of the index than most people. And you re- know how much realize, up, right? you know how much financials were up last year? A lot, right? Thirty two percent. Okay. So the the one that you the other one you predicted was that the the stock market will fall this year, and have its worst year since two thousand eight. But you said that could be the worst year could be, like what a five or six percent pullback. Yeah, I mean, so the so what I said was twenty twenty two will be the worst year since two thousand eight. Whoop de do it. The worst year since two thousand eight was negative six percent. So not exactly a Mark Faber like call, but I think what did I say? The S P is going to fall fifteen percent this year. Okay, that's what you're. Okay, that, that's a that, that'd be a decent one, which wouldn't be out of their own possibilities. So I actually looked, and y- you look at those charts that show what happens to the S and P when it's up in a given year. What happens the next year? So I actually looked. The average return following a twenty percent gain, which we just had in the S and P, going back to nineteen twenty eight, is nine point seven percent. That's average, which is basically the long term average. It's positive seventy percent of the time after a twenty percent gain. Uh, after a thirty percent gain, which we were close to, the average return nine point nine percent. Basically, what happens in one year tells you almost nothing about what's going to happen the next year. But then I looked, okay, let's put these into context because we've had 31% in 2019, 18 in 2020, and then 29 in 2021. So if, how, we, if we fell 15% in 2022, the four-year annualized return would still be tremendous. Yes, but I looked. So how often have we ever seen th- more than three years in a row of double-digit returns? Oh, it's a pretty, lot. Pretty well, that's pretty rare. Oh, really? D- hmm. Double digit. So 1942 to 1945. This I'm looking at four year, four years in a row. Four years in a row. Okay. Yeah. So more than three. So 1942 to 1945, you had this huge. It was like it, it was up a lot, and that's that was still some of the war stuff, but also bouncing back from the Great Depression. 1949 to 1952. So you had two of these like really close together, and then 1995 to 1999 is the all time run. So, so we're, it's only three times in history that you've seen three years in a row of double-digit returns, and then a next year happened again. Well, if 2022 is up 15% or something like that, it would be a historic four-year run. Pretty much. That, that, so so you're, you're saying that it could fall or not do as well is, is actually not a bad call historically. It has happened, but it's, it's, it's pretty rare. So I looked at the new highs for the index. So it was up, I think a bunch of people said this was 70 new all-time highs, 
in 2021. That's more. I mean, this is fun. Second numbers. most ever. Yes, 1995 that, at 77. That honestly blows my freaking mind. So, I, I looked. That's did it, did it did it feel did it feel like a banner year for stocks? I think it was just a really easy year. I guess like slowly but surely chipping away because there was only a five percent downturn was the biggest peak to trough drawdown. The thing is, in I, look, I looked this up in 1995. The worst peak to trough drawdown in a, in a year, the S&P was up 37%. That's the year with the most record highs was like 2.5%. That was the worst drawdown. That, I mean, that, that happens in a day most times. But so Any, last, any nit, nitpicks on my, on my predictions? I don't think. Well, okay, I have, I have one. Uh, you said the Fed will lower rates. That was, that was spicy. If, if that happens, I will quit my role as the uh, emeritus Fed chairman. What do you call it? <laughs> I, I'm going to quit that because so you said they'll raise rates, the market will fall apart, then they'll lower rates. I, I just think if you're going to start raising rates now and you can't do it now, and like if they had to lower rates just because the stock market fell 10 or 15%, at that point, you're you're blatantly making it obvious that that's all that we care about. <laughs> I'll do you one. Oh, it's not obvious yet. I'll do you one better. If they lower rates, I'm changing my last name to Schiff. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't. I mean... I just can't really see that happening. It, it's it's possible, it, but again, if they if they do that, then rates for sure are never going higher. Because if they can't do it now, when when will they? I think there's still people that believe in the Fed. Like, um, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of people. I'm not one of those people that I don't think like I don't think the Fed's a bunch of idiots. I don't think they're like always behind the curve and ruining the country and all that sort of shit. Um, but if they do lower rates, like they will lose credibility with pretty much everybody except for maybe you. There are certain a lot of brains that have been broken from the Fed. So I, I posted my chart that I talked about in the lead-in for Y charts about how it's we've had almost 19% annual return since the bottom in 2009. And I, I mean, I should know this, but every time you do this, I get 20 to 25 people on Twitter saying, yeah, have you, have you compared it with the Fed's balance sheet? Or how about M2 money supply? Right. Or like, what did people complain about in the bull market of the 50s and 60s or the 80s and 90s? Like, what did they blame it on? Because it feels like people just want to blame it. It's it's almost like these people hate making money. I wonder if back in the day, people, crazy as it sounds, didn't blame anyone for a bull market. They just enjoyed the bull market. That's what it's like. Okay, great. I don't care why it happened. It happened. It's here. And guess what? The Fed is not all of a sudden going to go, you know what? We're done. We're out of here. See you guys later. You're on your own. That's not going to happen. Yeah, get a clue. They're part of the they're part of the market whether you like it or not. Right, that's what I mean. Get a clue, not to be so rude, but like they they're not going anywhere. They're not the Fed will not resign. And All right. you, let, let's get into this. Speaking of the Fed, so we got a few emails. There was an article in where was this? Poli- I don't remember. I, it doesn't matter. Um, talking about oh here's here, let me just read the email. I am 67 and I've been retired for five years, living off my investment portfolio. I've been a long-term buy and hold investor for almost 40 years and, and I'm currently about 60, 40. I consider myself a fairly sophisticated investor. After reading the article above, I am seriously considering reducing risk in my portfolio. Uh, do you think there's any... Ch- okay. Um, oh, he said, do you think there's any chance on the limit on, on I-bonds will be significantly increased? Well, if the Fed or... I don't know. This is not the Fed's decision. Who is Who makes that decision? The Treasury? Yeah, I guess if the Treasury is listening to this podcast, they would know it's a good idea. We have many listeners in the Treasury, so I'd like to believe. Please, raise that cap. So I, I read this article. You know, it's not all bad, but some of it I, I definitely took on with. For example, between 2008 and 2014, the Federal Reserve printed more than $3.5 trillion in new bills. To put that in perspective, it's roughly triple the amount of money that the Fed created in its first 95 years of existence. Three centuries worth of growth in the money supply was crammed into a few short years. I would say to this person, read Colin Roche if you want to know the truth about what actually happened. There was not $3.5 trillion worth of currency that was printed. My way of looking at this is that most people who say the word money printing or the term money printing have no idea what it actually means. People assume that the Fed is literally handing money to people and then it's going into the stock market. That's not what happening, what's happening at all. And that's, I don't, not, that's not how this works. I'll admit, I still don't quite know exactly what quantitative easing is. I mean, I've read Colin for years and I know reserves, deposits, creation, overnight, blah, blah, blah. But it's not like literally new currency flooding the system. And that's why we didn't get inflation the last time around. But the government sending checks to people is literally creating new money. That's, that's money printing. So anyway, so I read the whole article and 
he the 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 author is basically taking somebody who was inside the Federal Reserve and resigned in 2011. He was one of the dissenters who really disagreed with quantitative easing, did not want to do it. Let me just say that without QE, we should have done more. I think that's the lesson from this time is we should have done way more. We didn't do enough. Uh, and probably enough, I, maybe we did enough on the, on the monetary side. We should have had a different fiscal response. Anyway, be that as it may. So this whole article was about how there was somebody inside the Fed who's been warning for years that we're going to get inflation because he saw the 1970s and now we're getting it. And see, he told you if the Fed just listened, and, but all that bullshit. The author of this article, his name is Christopher Leonard, actually wrote a book that I very much enjoyed called The Meat Racket. It was an inside look at, uh, I think it was Purdue, the chicken company, the poultry company. Um, but anyway, he's writing a book and the book is called The Lords of Easy Money, How the Federal Reserve Broke the American Economy. And I wish I knew that before I wasted my time reading this article. So the point is, literally these same arguments about money printing and the dollar going to hell and you shouldn't buy stocks, it's poison. It is absolute mental poison. And I'm not saying that you know stocks can't fall and inflation can't get worse. Of course it can. But yes, yeah, so what? There's always a risk. And if you invest as if you're trying to ignore or sidestep every risk, you will never survive a bull market. And guess what? People talk about survival a lot, like you have to survive a bear market. You have to survive a bull market. What if this goes on for another five years? Right. The, the, I mean, the, the Fed hates stuff. A lot of people say like the creation of the Fed was the end of like the American economy. I looked at this for one of my books. Basically, before the Fed was enacted in 1913, and for the first 20 or 30 or even 50 years of their existence, they didn't really do much. Like They made the Great Depression worse. But we had a depression or a recession basically every two years on average, it, all the time. When we were on the gold standard, it would just we would have these crushing recessions and depressions all the time. It was such a more of a boom bust. And if anything, they've helped take some volatility out of the system. Obviously, we're a much more mature economy now. But yeah, it's... It's really, really tough if you're investing based on this stuff, especially anything that says doomsday in the headline. I think you, you can pretty safely ignore what they say. So let's stick with this, Ben, because I, I read an article that pissed me off over the weekend. Uh, it's stock market FUD. For people that don't know what FUD is, it's I think it's a crypto term. It means fear, uncertainty, and doubt. People that are spreading you know, uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, I guess. <laughs> um, so this is the lead in the New York Times article. For two years... The stock market has been largely able to ignore the lived reality, I'm sorry, the lived reality of Americans during the pandemic, the mounting coronavirus cases, the loss of lives and livelihoods, the lockdowns because of underlying policies that kept it buoyant. Investors can now say goodbye to all that. Um okay. So this entire article was nothing but basically striking fear into the hearts of its readers that 2021 was as good as it's going to get. And the only reason why we were up was because of of monetary policies. And as the Fed normalizes, they're acting like the Fed is jacking rates up to 13%. As the Fed normalizes, it's all going to come crashing down without any mention of the fact that the stock market is driven by something called earnings and earnings are at an all-time high. No mention of that. Nowhere in the article is as if it's all just manipulated by the Fed. And, and here, here's some more. So there was a, there's a, this guy, Aaron Brown, who's now, who, he's very well known in quantitative circles. He was, a, I think he's a professor now. He worked at AQR for many years. Uh, he's talking about like the nightmare scenario is that the Fed tightens and it doesn't help. Uh, talk about soft landing. I don't know what, uh, and things get ugly fast. Here's a quote. And then he said, the Fed may have to take very aggressive actions like a rate hike to 15%. Or wage and price controls like we tried in the 70s. And the thing about this article that really pisses me off is I actually don't disagree with a lot of it, but it's so sensational. They use the word panic in here. It's literally just nothing but bad news after bad news after bad news and warnings. And how is an average po person supposed to read this and not go, holy shit, I have to protect my portfolio. I have to get out of the market. And then secondly... The get you know the Gelman amnesia effect, yes. Where you you'll read an you'll read an article where you have particular expertise and you'll rip it to shreds like we're doing right now, then turn the page and just blank slate, <laughs> believe whatever the author is writing. And I hate doing this to discredit the the you know, the media. I don't like doing it, but this really 
sucks. It sucks that the New York Times, and it's not just the New York Times, of course, it's basically every financial publication does shit like this to their readers. It it sells, I guess. I, I mean, this is when have you ever when's the last time you ever heard any good news about like the COVID situation? I know it seems to just be getting worse and worse. It it feels like it, but there's there's no one out there really who's who's saying like let's look for some positives in this situation because the negativity that stuff it just sells better, and I think people have learned that. And, and it's hard. Just- to, it's hard being optimistic. Like I've I, I I've done this post a million times. Like gradual improvements going notice. What, give me a list of reasons to be bullish right now. I don't have one. I can give you a million reasons to be bearish. So I get it. But All right, let me let me let me let me balance you out here on the on the positive side. So I'm looking at this, and I, I was looking at that chart saying that we're up 800 percent from the bottom, and it's 19 percent annualized returns. It's thinking like, okay, that that's that's way too much. There's no way that can keep going. So I wanted to look, and I wanted to compare like what are the best bull markets in U.S. history. And so I looked back, and and I'm totally cherry picking here because besides like the semantics involved and like, let's define a bull market as a 20% gain or, or it resets after this or wait, only new highs. There really is no definition of a bull market, right? So I'm, because this is our show, I made this up. So I'm basically saying a bull market is anytime we, it, it ends with like a 40, 50% crash. If you don't have that, the bull market continues. So, so did, did the bull market, sorry to, to bust balls, but did the bull market end in 2020? Nope. Because that's our 1987. Okay. Did the because the bull market did not end in nineteen eighty. So I'm I, this is this is Ben's definition of a bull market. Well, can I just say one thing about this before we get into it? Because I'm doing the same post, I, I guess. And from nineteen eighty seven to nineteen ninety one, the market was flat. So like it, w- yeah, we we got all the gains back, but it took like almost four years. True, but I think everyone agrees the eighties and nineties were a bull market. True. Even if you because you're going to have periods in between there. I know it's semantic. You, Sorry. All right, go on. So I broke this up, and I'm. Granted, I'm cherry picking here, but I looked at these time frames that we've basically had three bull markets going back to the late 1920s. This is Ben's Ben's definition of a bull market. So from like 1929 to 1941, the total return, that's obviously including the Great Depression. And then Wait you the a minute. In 37. You're starting the bull market in 1929? No, no, no. I'm, I'm showing what. So this is this is the bear market that precedes the bull. Okay. So the total return from 1929 to 1941 was 35%. So stocks lost a third of their value over 13 years. So then 1942 is when, like you got, I already mentioned, you had those four years in a row. That's when I'm starting the bull market. From 1942 to 1968, the U.S. stock market was up 3,800%, like 15% a year for a really long time. What do you think the worst year, calendar year was in that period? From, so we're talking uh, almost ni- 30 years. 66? Well, what do you, like, oh. as far as a loss goes, what was the worst down year in the stock market? 13%. Like 10%, basically. 10 or 12%. But the, the, the thing is, like thinking in cycles like that is like kind of fun, but useless. It's like, I'm putting the super cycle. So then we have 1969 to 1978. You have a total return of 30%, which was way worse after you take inflation. Wait, say that one more time. Uh, Oh, okay. Total return from 69 to 78. Then 79 to 99, you're up another 3000%. Okay. Now here's where the cherry picking gets really bad. I thought the, I thought the bull market started in 82, but Right. It, 79 was up like 20%. 80 was, you know, 80 was up and then I think 81 was down a little. All right. From the year 2000 to March 2009, granted, peak to bottom, the stock market over those negative 10 years six? or so, it was like negative 50. Oh, I'm sorry, annualized. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. It was it was like negative six or, and then March 2009 to now is like plus 800. All right. So what, I'm what saying, we, what's the point? If we get another super cycle like we had in the past 20 or 30 years, Tom Lee's quadrupling of the S&P from here is not out of the question. Right. Okay. So let's talk about that. I don't think it's out of the question either. What if, what's, what's the multiple on the S&P 500 right now? Is it 25? I honestly don't know. Sure. I don't really pay attention, honestly. What if it, what if that goes up by 30% and and, and, and and earnings earnings rise and earnings continue to grow? Obviously historical analogies, you can basically throw most of them out the window, but I'm just saying like, these really long super cycles, even though they have 20 or 30% downturns in the midst of them, can last way longer than anyone could. Obviously, so small think, sample size, yada, yada, all that yes, stuff. I don't think anybody's prepared for a super cyclable market for this no. to last for another 10 years. No now, way. Now, you could say everybody's positioned for it, right? Because yeah. <laughs> yes. household net worth and equities is an all-time high. So, But mentally... Nobody's predicting, and I'm definitely not, obviously. Nobody's predicting that this lasts another 10 years. Anyway, the point is, you have to survive a bull market. Have we learned nothing? 
And I'm not saying to disregard the risk, but don't you think that the market prices in the risks better than you can? So, all right, I was I was doing my post uh, 10 lessons or something like that. I can't remember which post it was. And I was looking at the cape ratio stuff and I came across this. Hey, why do just, you think why do you think blogging lists always come down to 10? 10 is like the perfect number for a blog list. Because you know, I never do eight. Okay, I think I've done nine a few times, just to, okay. just to, just to be different. Yeah. So, uh, research affiliates tried dunking on me in 2018. I think this was from 2018. They wrote a really long article called... Oh, this was a dunk. You sent this to me. I thought this was like a... Uh, thought this was giving you a pat on the back. Oh, no. They were dunking on me. <laughs> oh, I forgot about this. This okay. is 2018, January 2018 by Rob Arnott himself uh, and two other colleagues. Why Cape Fear why Cape naysayers are wrong. And they quoted something that I wrote in 2017, which I think holds up pretty nicely. I wrote, comparing the Cape ratio from 1960 to today is like comparing Oscar Robertson to Russell Westbrook. Same game, but things have changed. Now- It's pretty good, actually. Thank you. It's, it's, it's about four years later. Dunk back on you, sir. <laughs> 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 that was a follow-up dunk, yes. What do you say? I'm just defending my honor. Okay, because so you, you, you slacked this this weekend, and I wasn't really paying attention that much, and I saw it, and I said, oh, they, nice, that's nice they quoted you. I didn't realize that they're were, that was they quoting you as a dunk. Not only was it a dunk quote, Ben, of me, it was not like in the text. Like They gave me like a header. Yes, you were the cape skeptic. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, all right, uh, let's talk about hedge funds. There was a tweet this week showing various hedge funds and their performance. And the S&P was up 28% and a lot of hedge funds were down, uh, were, were, did, were, were up much, much, much less than 28%. I'm here to defend hedge funds. Well, you know, the great thing is though, anytime something like this gets posted, I know exactly what's going to happen. First, you know come, yeah, of course. Of first course. come, people are going to be dunking and say, yeah. "See, you should add all your money in yeah. the S and P five hundred, not two and 20. Right. Then the people who come back, they're always the people who have capital in their name on Twitter. Wrong it's some pseudonymous right. person, right. blank capital. Right. They say, "Oh, so we're comparing hedge funds to the S and P five hundred now." And then you have the people fighting the comments, and that, that's pretty much the the gist of it. All right. Well, here's where I am. Listen, folks. Obviously, hedge funds in general, which is such a stupid thing to classify hedge funds as one sort of thing, right? Because there's literally 10,000 of them. But let's just find, let's let's be unfair and group them together. It's been it's been tough keeping up with the in a bull market. Obviously, they hedge, they're not fully long, but here's the thing. Let's say that their net exposure, I'm making this up, is does 60% work? Sure. Okay. So then 60% of the S&P For a was long up, short fund, yeah. Was 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 17%. The problem is so many funds did so bad. Like if the if the S&P is up 30, and again, I mean, if the S&P is up 30, how do you lose 22%? So how do you Melvin, lose Melvin? Melvin down 42% is great because GameStop really won against Games, them. GameStop direct them. So anyway, if, if you're in a hedge fund and you made, I don't know, 14% last year, are you really pissed? So I feel like, the financial blogging community had a good four or five years there of debates about hedge funds. Why hedge fund performance is so bad? Why are there so many of them still? If fees are so high and performance is so bad. And this is one of the great things about crypto because I feel like crypto has totally pushed hedge funds out of the limelight. Yeah. Like I feel like there's not much hedge fund discourse anymore. Good. It's kind it's of not, it's, it's, it's kind of one of those topics that like index funds, it's like, okay, we've already had this discussion enough. Let's move on. Like we've we've already sussed this out. Let's let's move on. I'm with you. There, what, what, what else is there to say? But anyway, yeah, listen, in a, in a, in the, by the way, was 2021, what was it like the seventh best year of all time? Ninth best year? No, by the way, I looked at this. There have been since 1928, 17 times the S&P has been up 30%. So How this, th this wasn't even, 17 times. So this is like not even top 20 in terms of best years ever. Okay. But, but I, I said it's one of the best years ever in a blog post based purely on volatility and drawdowns because there was just nothing to speak of. Yeah. All right. Speaking of things that are kind of boring that we don't really speak much about, I want to talk about ESG for a second. There was an art, a very good article in Bloomberg. Remember Larry Fink put out a letter two years ago saying that uh, like, like lecturing CEOs that there's, he said, quote, we believe that sustainability should be our new standard for investing. Do you remember that? Yes. Big ESG push by BlackRock. Yeah. This is interesting. Okay. 
They they have a big giant ETF. The ticker is ESGU. It went from 1.6 billion at the start of 2020 to 16.4 billion. And what happened was on January 15th, 2020, the day after Fink's letter, BlackRock altered its most popular suite of model portfolios ah. by adding ESGU into its fund. So so everyone gets like a 3% allocation to this fund now or something. So here's the deal. Here's a, this is a good quote. One rough analogy for what this has meant in financial services. Imagine if the world's largest grocery company declared it would lead an effort to shift the planet to more sustainable agriculture. And then the next day, it quietly slips some organic carrots into every fruit and vegetable box it offered customers across the US. <laughs> Suddenly, organic produce sales would show a huge spike, making it appear as if there was a massive demand shift underway for sustainable produce. So here's here's a few comments that I have on this. Um, I tweeted over the weekend, th- this is insane. Uh, iShares, the, the, the S&P 500 ETF for iShares, IVV, charges only three basis points, which is a beautiful thing. A huge win for investors. That's $100 million in fees on $335 billion in assets. Is that incredible? Yeah, it really is. Th- three basis points yielding $100 million in fees. All right, so I've, so ESGU. I'm sure someone's um, done this comparison before, but doesn't ARK probably make more money than Vanguard, even though Vanguard is 20 mm, times bigger than them or whatever? I There's got to be some yeah, close yeah, comparison where some active fund with not a lot of assets is making way more money than a place like Vanguard with $8 trillion in assets So they don't ES- charge a lot. ESGU charges 15 basis points as opposed to three. And... It's hard to get up in arms about a fund that charges 15 basis points. That's not exactly criminal, but I understand why people are pissed off because they're acting all holier than thou, making this big ESG push, charging five times the fees. And here's the rub, Ben. Here's the rub. Look at these two charts and tell me if you see any difference in the holdings. The first one is Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Tesla, Google, NVIDIA, Facebook, JP Morgan, Home Depot. That's the S&P 500, just straight up. And then here's ESGU. Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Tesla, Google, Facebook, NVIDIA, Berkshire, United Health. It's the exact same thing for all intents and purposes. So if anything, it's any of the companies that it's underweighting are really too small and don't matter anyway. It just so happened that they did outperform over the last three years. So the fees are moot point. Anyway, of all, it is funny, like where we've come to, like arguing that this is like uh, surreptitiously being done. ESG really angers a lot of financial professionals because they feel like, well, what are you really doing anyway? Right. It's it's hard to make the definitions work. The way I look at it, like if if a person who is investing thinks that investing based on their values will help them stick with their plan better, I don't I, I like I don't know why people are so up in arms about it. So so it's hard to get outraged uh, on the surface, but I think what people are are pissed off about is like, I guess they're just ju- done with BlackRock and certainly Larry F- Larry Fink wagging his finger. And then doing this, it just feels a little yucky, even though it's, you know, not that big of a deal. 15 basis points versus three basis points. That's the kind of argument you have in a bull market. Exactly. How's that? Exactly. Uh, But I did think this was an interesting story worth talking about because we don't really talk about this much. Uh, Jim Bianco put this on my radar. Uh, Lumber is roaring back. What the hell is happening? Did you know this was going on? (laughs) Sorry, I kind of turned my brain off for like the last two weeks, basically. You have to bring me back pick, back to speed here. So lumber prices are skyrocketing again. And why is this happening? I don't know. Okay. The Fed? No, seriously. I really. I mean, I, I don't know the the dynamics of the lumber market. I can't speak to that. But I thought we were done with this. But it's like the meme stocks. It just it's coming back for a second life. Don't like it. I'm I'm guessing housing demand is to remain strong. Has to be part of it. And then you're probably getting all these. Yeah, I don't know. I got nothing. Um, they they did have the Flexport guy Noah Noah Smith had this really long interview with the Flexport guy this Ryan Peterson guy we've talked about in the past and so he was talking about how like globalization was this amazing thing and he said ocean freight costs alone at like five to ten percent for the cost of everything we buy and ninety percent of the stuff we buy is shipped on a container ship so especially if you're buying stuff online um, and he said that the, the globalized supply chain and shipping containers brought down the cost of shipping goods and manufacturing by close to 90% over the last 50 years. So it's been a very good thing. But he's saying once you lose that, and, and he basically said the whole thing is just there was so much more demand, and especially online demand for everything, that the, the global supply chain was just not set up for this. 
Clearly not. But I want to tell you something that, that surprised me. I ordered a, 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 a couple of standing desks um, for the office and shipping says two to five days. How about that? It's not bad, right? And the thing is, if I'm looking for something on Amazon and there's 12 different choices, guess which one I'm going to pick? The one that has the shortest shipping date. Yeah, I really it's, thought it's that not this price is, anymore. It's shipping. I really thought that this was going to be uh, backlog, but maybe things are getting better. But he he talked in this interview. It's again, it's a really long interview, but I think it's worth reading. It, it's 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 helps you understand this whole dynamic better. But he was saying, listen, people com- like trying to blame the president and the way out for this for this stuff. Like, there's not one person who controls this. But he did say, here's what I would do if I was put in charge of this. And if I'm running the White House, I'm hiring this guy to be the supply chain czar for the next 12 months and showing people like, hey, we're going to we're going to take some of these regulations off and we're going to allow it. He's saying like you can bring the National Guard in to bring more of these trucks in, which I, I think I mentioned that in the, our podcast with Derek Thompson, not even knowing if that was a possibility. It just kind of sounded good in my mind. But uh, apparently the National Guard might have this stockpile of trucks that they can actually use to help. Well, what are we waiting for? So I'm saying Biden administration should hire this guy supply chain czar and he can show how he's helping move stuff faster and this guy's saying like these shipping costs are directly are directly having a problem with inflation like you could you could use this as something as like a victory to show people that you're trying to help with the inflation stuff going on that people are still angry about i just clicked on this uh article before that we were talking about that that doomsday uh fed guy warning the title of the article is oh this is from politico the Fed's doomsday profit has a dire warning about where we're headed. I mean, could you think of anything more clickbaity? And that's that's the world we live in. Clicks. It's all about clicks. Profit with a PH. That that always works really the well Fed's when you're investing based on someone who says that. Profit. How many people read this article and said, that's it. Tomorrow I'm selling my stocks. I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> and especially like, so the person who emailed us who said they were in their 60s or se- getting close to their 70s. Yeah, what about do you to do? Retire. What do you do? But, those are the people that are scared because they say, listen, I'm not working anymore. I have no more income. So they want to protect it. So that, that's why those people are almost more apt to listen to something like that. I think it's ne- honestly, I, I think it's never been harder for the individual investor to ignore this bullshit. How do you do it? Yeah, it's I, I, well, the, the other problem is there's so much of it that if you just want to focus on the doomsday profit people, you can if you want to and just add all those negative stories up together yeah, and I, be I, like, I, I think I'm pretty cognizant of the downside of the risk in the market. I've like I write a lot about it, but this doesn't help anyone. No, not at all. Let's move on. Uh, per, so personal finance stuff. I thought this was interesting. There was a there was an article in the journal talking about like some some uh, money tests to to take off your to take off your to do list, and I wanted to get your take on this. Uh, Kenny's- By the way, have have you seen the on the your wife's to watch is like the Good Morning America? Of course, they have the Today Show like 2022 financial habits to make, you know, for a great new year. And it's like, create a budget, track your spends. It's, it's always just like, who is this helpful to? Come on. So this doesn't Kenny, work for anyone. This guy, Kenny Sinaur, a financial planner in Denver said, tracking every last dollar of your monthly spend, it can feel like empowering at first, but it's hard to sustain. He advises clients to focus on using a simpler approach, such as designating 50% of your paycheck to essentials, such as rent, 20% for savings, and 30% for everything else. I think this is very sound advice. I use I tracked my spending. There was this app that I used. I can't remember what it was called. It's exhausting. I stopped after like, I don't know, 30 days. I will say don't- this advice is totally context dependent on where you are on the income scale and the wealth 100%. scale in your life. So like someone just starting out trying to get a handle on their finances, tracking their spending is actually a good thing, I think. Yes, yes. Because I know people who had to go through like the envelope method. That's like the Dave Ramsey thing. And it's like, this is for rent, this is for food, this is for clothes. And just starting out, some people need that. And then when you graduate and you either make a little more money, you have that stuff under control and have a better idea of it, then you eventually have to get to this place. Because if you're going to track your spending your whole life and clip coupons and that that's that's a tough way to live it you're it'll just consume you you don't need to spend so much time on that stuff here's another way to fight inflation austin goolsby had this piece on the new york times and he was talking about the difference between buying stuff online and buying stuff in the store and actually saying that they track like online prices and they found that online prices are actually much lower than anything you buy like in a physical store and he's saying his whole thing is we need to start breaking out inflation by income classes because 
The more he said, the more sh- someone shops online rather than in stores, the less inflation the, that person has faced. And he his point was saying it's typically wealthier people that shop online more, and he thinks wealthy people are actually having a lower inflation rate right now because of that. That's an interesting point. Why why do you think stuff online is cheaper than stuff in the store? Well, it's it's easier to check prices with stuff online. It, it's easy to be more efficient. If you're in a physical store, you have just more overhead costs, and it has to be a higher price almost, right? I guess like having a physical location is more expensive than all the logistics and the shipping and all that sort of stuff. I guess at scale it is. Right. I think that's the point, which is why, yeah. But anyway, his, his overall point about breaking down inflation by income bracket um, in order to better diagnose policies and response, I think is sound. I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Although although that's that's a good way to anger people, especially who live in the coasts. Like it's impossible to have a conversation about income or housing without someone getting angry because they live in a very expensive place. Well, or they, they, you, they would say, listen to that. That income right. does not get me very far in San Francisco right. or whatever. But also, what do, you, what do you do with that information? True. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah. It's, right? I like, guess what, it's just easy to econ, good for econ wonks and useless to everyone else, I guess. Yeah. I mean, what's the policy response? Are you, I mean, anyway, I don't know. It's, it's, it was a good point. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess you're right. It's it's interesting to people who like that kind of data, like us, and then, yeah, maybe useless to everyone else. There was a news over the weekend or last week or wherever, Apple is paying an unusual $180,000 bonus to retain engineering talent. So they're trying, s- to, trying to stop the crypto outflow? Uh, not just crypto, but a lot of people that are leaving to start new companies. And yeah, crypto is obviously in there. Somebody Somebody also tweeted over the weekend, I just quit the Apple design team. I know they're not engineers, but same thing. I just quit the Apple design team to work on crypto full time. So we, if you missed it on Saturday, we had a really long conversation with Howard Lindzen, where we just kind of let him go on his career and investing in startups and all this stuff. And he made a great point that like, there's now probably more ideas than there are people to execute on those ideas. Because like, if, if you're a startup trying to find good engineers, if you're not one of those people who left Apple as an engineer to do it yourself is going to be really hard because that it's easier to just say, I'm going to invest in startups than it is to say, I'm actually going to get my hands dirty and build mm. a startup myself. Yes. I thought that oh, was a really great point. Can you, can you uh, for people that didn't listen, can you um, explain the point that Howard made about why VCs were so focused on Wealthfront and Betterment instead of, and missed the, oppor- missed the opportunity with Robinhood? Yeah. So that was it. So we asked him, like, Howard invested in Robinhood in like the idea phase in 2013. 2013, yeah. And it's kind of funny. He was just an investor. He wasn't. I don't think he was really doing much advising. He said if, if he did any advising, he gave him bad advice about not doing free commission <laughs> trading. But he, as being a person who's out there in the limelight a little bit, he's synonymous with Robinhood, even though he just made an investment in them because he saw this retail trading thing coming. He's like social, the con, you know, confluence of social media and people wanting to do stuff on their own and young people. He's like, there's going to be this huge retail trading boom, and he was totally right. I wrote a post saying, and then like 2017, he told us this at the bar. In uh, that where, remember at the at the conference at the Dana Point conference, he was telling us about this. Oh, we went he, to that together. He, okay, man, I I'm, I oh oh Dana Point. Oh oh, I was thinking Coronado. I missed yeah. I missed Oktoberfest. So he so he was telling us about that over a beer, like how this is going to happen. And we were we were at an evidence based investing conference about talking about index funds, being like, yeah, right, okay, sure, sure. <laughs> and he was totally right. And but his whole thing was all the VCs tried to remake Vanguard with Wealthfront and Betterment. Obviously, Wealthfront and Betterment have become relatively large firms, but not nearly as large, I think, as people thought at the time. And his point was like, Vanguard's okay. Like Wealthfront and Betterment have much better technology and onboarding than them. But But Vanguard was mostly good enough. Yeah, good. Vanguard was mostly good enough. And he said, that's what people miss and how so many people miss like the Robin Hood thing. And he was at the forefront of it because people were trying to recreate something else. Yeah. Anyway, was that was it. a fun that was a fun conversation. Um, all right, bullshit survey of the week from Nickel Digital. Eighty five percent of institutional investors, wealth managers, have dedicated crypto teams. We don't Oof. even need to like <laughs> suss this out. It's so obviously nonsensical. But what made me laugh was I clicked on the article because uh, I wanted to like read it. And Ben, look at this. Look at this. I put in the doc. So I'm reading it, and it says new study of. Inst-. I'm like new study. Where's the A? Look where the A is. <laughs> it's off the page. And then there's an actual ad. Well, it looks like a fake meme or something. It's it's two guys and a lady sitting at what looks like a dinner table with like a bowl of guacamole, and it just says "invest in crypto like a pro." What the hell is this? Where did Literally, you find this website? This? I feel like this is the kind of website you click on, and then all of a sudden your credit card information is just gone. 
<laughs> uh, somebody tweeted, I can't remember, but just nonsense on stilts. Uh, I, I do wonder if the institutional crowd, if they're mostly just trying to be in hedge funds of this or, or how they're how they're looking at it. Because I, I, I'm sure there's a lot of like endowments and foundations and pensions. Do you think it's everything it's, in between? It's still going to take years and years. Yeah, I mean, there's always like the forward thinking ones. But most of these places take so long to get something like this ever instituted in their portfolio that it's going to be a long time for a lot of the, a lot of the other also rands basically. Well, Ben, I've I've got you covered. I have data or or this article nickel 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 digital. Yeah, nickel digital asset management has data. They said, "quote When it comes to investing in crypto and digital assets, only twenty percent of professional investors say they prefer beta strategies, with thirty four percent opting for alpha focus." Ben, let me ask you a question. What about the other 46%? Do they want neither alpha nor beta? What comes after alpha and beta in the Greek alphabet? They want some delta? Omicron? Yeah, I don't know. It, it, Speaking uh, of Omicron, man, this sucks. Uh, Logan, my two-year-old, woke up whatever day. What day is today? Monday, maybe Thursday. Glassy eyes. Fever. Tested him. Immediate, immediate results of positivity. Isn't it crazy how quick that line comes up if you have it? It was like before we even dunked it in. It, That's it, what it, mine was. You, you just knew it, right? So I don't know how this whole freaking thing is very strange. My So rapid, uh, the at-home test showed that he was positive. We did PCR for him. I, so I took an at-home test immediately, negative. My wife, negative. We got a PCR test for Kobe and Logan and me and my wife. And the three of us were negative. He was positive. Was so it like I, a drive through one they had to go to? Uh, somebody, no, somebody actually came to our house. Oh, that's nice. Um, my neighbor was paying somebody to come to the house, so we, we hopped on that. But anyway, uh, so the first day, he's fine now. The first day, he was like done, toast, just couldn't lift his head, was basically on the pillow the entire day. But uh, yeah, it's just, it's it's an insane inconvenience. Thank God nobody got really sick. But now we're home. We were home with the boys the week before the break and now we're home again. And I think that parents at some point are going to revolt. Now, obviously, yes. obviously if you have a sick child, keep them home, whether it's a cold, a flu or COVID. But also crazy that no, no one else in your house has gotten sick. I, it's very bizarre. I almost, I was getting FOMO. I almost want, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm getting left out. I almost out. want you should, COVID. You should, you should get an antibody test to see if you've already had it. But if you do the antigen test, so Josh was telling me this, that he already had it, but don't they tell, can't, how do they differentiate between, the vaccine and an actual COVID. Can they do that? I think they can. Uh, that's a good question because they, they did a test for my, my wife wanted to get my son tested because he, we, he t- had a positive test. We didn't do the PCR. And she's like, I wonder if he didn't have it. Cause he had zero symptoms at all. And she got a test that his antibodies like through the roof. So going forward, like my, my uh, daycare is quarantined twice because the teachers had it. I feel like they can't do that anymore. You, you can't just keep shutting school down. Yeah. And we're fine. We could like, you know, but some people I aren't agree. fine. Some people don't have the luxury of, of having two parents that could work from home. And my wife can't really work. She's a guidance counselor, but. But it sounds like a lot of schools came back from that winter break and stayed closed or went online or you're right. The parents, this, if you're a single person or you have no kid, like you're in a totally different experience with this disease than you are if you have kids, especially kids who haven't been vaccinated yet, which obviously, you know, it's, it seems like vax or unvax, the kids under five, they don't seem to do too bad. But yeah, you're just right. The disruption and the uncertainty is just, it's awful to deal with. And who's getting who's not as weird. I was two weeks ago, I was with uh, people in a bar. Everybody got it. Seemingly everybody got it. I didn't get it. And then this weekend, the people I was with got it. Logan got it. I did. And anyway, it's, uh, it is trying. All right. Listen to questions. All right. Hey guys, I've got $400,000 in cash credit to you, um, that I've earmarked for a home remodel in the next 12 months. Damn. $400,000 for a is, remodel. Is he going to add like the, the playboy hot tub grotto? What's <laughs> what are we doing here? <laughs> Man. Um, okay. Or is that just what it costs for a new kitchen these days? I put, yeah, exactly. That's 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 the inflation. I put fifty thousand dollars in BlockFi stablecoin to earn nine percent after hearing the latest podcast you did with their CEO. 
Seems too good to be true. I tested it out, took money out to make sure I really could get it out. Why wouldn't I put another $200,000 in there instead of sending it to Marcus? What is the real risk of that stablecoin in BlockFi? We actually had, so Zach was talking about this because we said like, what's the risk? And he said, well, I mean, if it's like saving money for a house, you know, that's that's probably a risk you don't want to take. If it's saving, by the for way, we get we get some form of this question all the time. once a week. Yeah. So, I, the 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 best way to think about this, I think, is uh, somebody basically said, like, think of BlockFi or any of these earned products as like a single B bond, right? You're getting a spread over the risk free rate, and you're taking on credit risk. Yeah, they and said it's almost you, like it's almost like high yield. Yeah, so so would you put two hundred thousand dollars into a single bond issuing corporation? Maybe, maybe not. I think the thing with this is it's really hard to quantify the risk because, in my opinion, and I've got plenty of money in 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 an earned product. I think the risk is I don't care if it goes from eight down to six. The right. risk is that it gets hacked or that it's gone. Yeah, I think that that that's my biggest worry is like the unquantifiable one of the risk is these things are still relatively new. And you just don't know. So, and so, so I think Zach said, like, hey, listen, if you're saving for a boat, yeah, put money in some of this. If you're saving for like emergencies, maybe you you have that somewhere else. I think that's yeah, that's that's a good way to put it. Listen, this should not be an emergency fund, okay? It's emergency funds are not risky by definition. They should have zero risk. The only risk that you should take with your emergency fund is inflation, right? Okay, I'm guaranteed to lose two percent nominal or real. I'm sorry, over the next twelve months. So that's how that's how we think about this. Um, you can go back and listen to that episode with Zach if you want. 